Okay, good. So go over, I'll, I'll hit it up on my, my camera. And we'll smash them together. So guys, just in case I forgot, this is Barry Williams. Don't know if you met him before. <laughs> hey. 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 Cool. All right, yes. Barry, the floor is yours. My name is Barry, and I'm a skydiver. Hi, Barry. Hi, Barry. <laughs> okay. Um, so who's uh, first safety day? Beer. Yeah. Yeah. Seems like a lot of people brought beer, so thank you very much. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about some canopy safety. Um, so let's open this up. Actually, what do you, what do, you, what would you guys want to talk about canopy safety? Anything? Whatever you want to talk about. Oh, I'm going to talk about whatever I want to talk about. Upsizing. Downsizing. Upsizing. Upsizing. Downsizing. 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 What else? Low terms. Sizing Low terms. in general. Huh? Sizing in general. Sizing in general. Does size matter? Size does matter. <laughs> what about people just coming over to buzz you or play with you um, while you're in a canopy and you don't know who they are, they can talk to you about it beforehand, they you scare the crap out of you. Okay. Anything else? No. All right, the reason why I ask that is we can talk about canopy safety for months. All right, so I'm only going to do 15, 20 minutes or whatever. So I think my goal is just to kind of make you think a little bit differently about canopy safety and the choice of canopy and, and that sort of thing. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about, I guess. And we'll have some questions and answer and whatever, and you know, shoot me an email and you know where I'm at. So uh, feel free to find me or any other instructor. So you got that statement that uh, guns don't kill people, people kill people, right? So next slide. Canopies don't kill people, people kill people. Right? Cool. It's really not the canopy that's the problem. It's what's underneath it and the thing that's controlling it. If you know what you're doing, you can swoop a navigator. You can swoop a saber. Right? You can also give a novice a velocity and they may be able to land it. But on the flip side is you can kill yourself under a navigator. You can certainly kill yourself under a velocity. So, it's really about education and figuring out what is going to be appropriate for you and what type of jump you're going to be doing and that sort of thing. And, and that, I think that's what we kind of want to talk about today. Um, another thing I want to think about is when I'm dealing with AFF students, when, when they don't pass a level and they're all bummed out, we did their level three and they're freaking out and they're like, oh, I sucked. You know, you got to keep things in perspective. That student has only done less than three minutes of actual practice. I can only think of maybe one thing you'd master in about three minutes, right? So we need to keep things into perspective. When we talk about canopy piloting, when you look at a master skydiver de-license with 500 jumps, if you do the math, that's about 20 minutes of actual practice under a, a parachute. Mm -hmm. That's like, for those people that have real jobs, less than half a work week. So. You get to 500 jumps, you're like, I'm ready for a velocity, okay? That's like throwing the keys to an indie car to a 16-year-old. Because they've only got 20 minutes to really practice under it. And we spend so much time in the wind tunnel, but we don't really do a lot of practice under KNP. Don't, we don't do a lot of drills. Now, the USBA, we have the B license requirement. Um, and I think that's really kind of helped a lot. Um, when I do those canopy courses, a lot of people do tend to come back because they realize that I really have no idea what I'm doing. I, I, wow, I thought I knew it. But that's the thing, you know, when we talk about this, um, that we don't know what we don't know. Okay, and a friend of mine, uh, Alistair McCartney, um, from Britain, world champion skydiver, came up with this thing called the knowledge protocol. So, <laughs> next slide. Okay. So there's our thinking cap. I want to change how we think about anything in skydiving for that matter, but particularly with canopy piling because, you know, we saw a lot of presentation and a lot of the fatalities come from under fully functioning parachutes. So instead of thinking, I know what I'm doing, whether it's canopy piling, or flying a camera, belly flying, free flying, whatever, I want you to ask yourself, what don't I know? And if you actually go into whatever you're doing with that mindset of like, hey, there's stuff that I probably don't know. And if you allow yourself to not know that stuff, it'll open up your mindset. 
You know, a lot of things with gear. Right, Chris there? Where you at? Yeah. Right. <laughs> what, ha what happened with your uh, your handle there? Right, because it was a, it was one of those free fly handles, right? So he didn't know that there's kind of a different deployment action. So same thing with canopy. We don't know what we don't know. So if we ask ourselves what don't we know, we'll ask more questions and keep learning more. Um, frequently asked question. When should I downsize? Okay, I'm going to flip this thing upside down too. So I just did uh, a recent article in dropzone.com with, uh, I was actually asked by Melissa Nelson, uh, now Melissa Lowe, and some guy named uh, Jason Malinsky. So we did an article, uh, next one, called uh, When Should You Upsize? And there's a lot of factors that kind of go along with this. And I think they're applicable to when you should downsize because I see a lot of people jumping canopies that quite frankly they shouldn't be. And you can kind of see it coming. But, not really the fun police, but I'll tell you when you're not doing something the smartest. So let's kind of go through some of these points here. So when should you upsize? Number 10, cannot land consistently standing up. It's kind of a no-brainer. All right, number nine, you're not current. Okay, when I've had injuries in the past, you know, jumping at 75 velocity, I think, you know, when come back and do maybe a, like a 120, um, like Sabre 2 or something like that, something a little a little less aggressive. And also it's, it's how often are you jumping? You know, if you're super, super current, yeah, okay, but if you're maybe doing one jump or two jumps every three months, you probably don't want something a little zippy. Uh, jumping at higher elevations, okay? We are at a higher elevation here as opposed to maybe Oceanside or maybe if you go down to Florida or whatnot. We do have uh, uh, altitude density to really kind of compensate. We don't have a lot of winds here. The canopies do move faster, so that's something we need to think about as well. So if you go jumping in Colorado, guess what? Your canopies will be a lot faster there, okay? Gain weight, wearing waist, okay? So if you're gaining weight or you're a tiny little girl and everybody's like, well, I need to be under a one-to-one -one wing loading, so I'm going to get a small one. And then be like, well, yeah, you are tiny, but guess what? When you're jumping with dudes that are 200 pounds, you're going to be need to need to wear 20 pounds of weight. So it does affect, you know, how your parachute's going to fly and how you're going to land it. Uh, reserve size. This is kind of important when people are kind of selecting what they have for gear. For most people, that reserve size should be uh, appropriate to their wing loading on their main. But sometimes you'll get people that uh, um, they, they got gear because it was a good deal. But that reserve size is, is really, really tiny and maybe not the uh, appropriate choice. Because when you have your first cutaway and you're freaking out, you're looking for your, your main and your free bag and now you're landing off and you did a, you know, you dropped your handles and you're like, oh shit. And now you're landing a smaller parachute under your reserve for the first time in the backyard, not really the time to, to figure out how to fly that parachute. Types of jumps, I think this is important as far as, you know, if you're if you're flying camera, you know, for, because they're getting out with tandems, they got a long spot. And a, a smaller parachute may not be able to make it back as well. Um, and also the, the type of openings as well. You don't want, you know, brisker openings. Most camera people have nice, slow, on heading openings. That's really what they want. So, and also for uh, wingsuiting, you know, you don't really want a high performance canopy for wingsuiting. So, depending on your discipline, it may make you want to upsize the canopy. And age, health, and agility, okay, we kind of talked about that when we talked about the fatality report. It's kind of common sense. Um, I am actually planning on upsizing now that I turn 40. I'm starting to, so. Uh, <laughs> attitude and experience, I think this is an important one. You'll get people that say things like, skydiving wouldn't be fun if I couldn't get killed by it. <laughs> Join the army. <laughs> yeah. Do something, you know, don't give the sport a bad name because you're too cool, you know, and you think it's, you know, this is dangerous and that's the way it should be and I need to put myself and others in jeopardy. But I know most of the, the newer jumpers, they can even spot these people. So they're people to kind of keep an eye out for. 
there's certainly people that when I, I get on the plane with them, I know exactly where they're at because I know their their canopy uh, piloting experience. <laughs> because you downsize and you shouldn't have. That's just people buying gear that they they shouldn't have. And I think from an experience uh, jumper perspective, you know, us looking out for each other, we shouldn't sell gear that we know is too small for other people. You know, I think that's slightly irresponsible because, hey, I need to get another rig, so you buy this one when they, they may not be ready for it. Okay? They have warning labels. They do have warning labels. <laughs> but the thing is, on the warning labels, the thing that baffles me sometimes is if you see these newer jumpers in there, uh, somebody had about 60 jumps and they wanted to be jumping in a 1.3 wing loading. And they're like, that's well within my experience. I'm like, oh my God. And you look at what the, the manufacturers recommend and those wing loadings are kind of low, you know, from, from the recommending, so it has like novice, intermediate, you know, advanced and then expert. And whatever wing loading the guy was at, he was at in the advanced or actually towards the expert. And I'm like, that is not your experience level, but we don't know what we don't know. Okay, and then the last one, if you can't answer yes to all of these questions, you should probably upsize. Ah, these are important. Can you land your main crosswind? Are you comfortable with landing crosswind? Can you land your main downwind? I think these are important because I think when we look at the fatality report, uh, people that aren't comfortable landing downwind or crosswind are more likely to execute a low turn, continue doing that turn, and then striking the ground at a high rate of speed. So downwind landings are not gonna kill you. Crosswind landings are not gonna kill you. Executing a low turn because you are afraid to go downwind or crosswind, probably gonna kill you. So if you're afraid of that canopy, you shouldn't be jumping as simple as that. Okay, uh, uh, accuracy if you need to land off, that sort of thing. <coughs> Understanding the flight characteristics, uh, the landing pattern stall, risers, that's about it, okay? That's good enough for that. And if you guys want to look at this, it is posted on dropzone.com, you can look up that article. Now, how do we make ourselves better, okay? Canopy coaching, whether it's the Excel Canopy coaching, or Flight One, or Brian Germain, or whoever you want to do, best thing to do is get some coaching. Even with, you know, belly flying and free flying, they are really worth, you know, their weight in gold, is, in my opinion. Because the other thing, what it's going to do down here, it's going to give us this male bovine fecal matter detector. Um, because you're going to hear a lot of really strange things. You just go on places like dropzone.com, or you hear somebody with 100 jumps telling somebody with 26 jumps how to do a front rise and turn on the final. You know, it, it gives you that little filter that says, this guy doesn't know what they're talking about. And then you can kind of go to somebody you trust and, and figure that out. Uh, so just a little bit, you know, I've been doing this for about 15 years and I've personally lost, uh, I stopped counting at about 30 people uh, that I consider friends. And my consideration of a friend is somebody I sat down with and had a beer and, and toasted to them. So that's about, you know, I stopped counting at 30, so I don't even know what it's at. So, you know, it's really important to, to give us a nice long career in skydiving. And how are we going to do that? We're going to, you know, we need to educate, our educate ourselves and check our ego at the door. Mistakes are a necessary point to learn. When you're a kid and riding a bike, you're going to fall off the bike. When you're flying a parachute, you're probably going to have some pretty bad landings. But it's important to allow yourself to have the, those mistakes and learn from them and being under canopy there's going to be safe for you to make those mistakes and being wise enough to know when you should be sitting on the ground and when it's going to be safe for you to jump. Um, and just to keep things in perspective, you know, I saw this incident once. The guy was uh, under 230 square foot silhouette at about a one-to-one -one wing loading. And he, you know, tib-fibbed himself and it was bad enough that you know, he hit an obstacle that, you know, if he didn't hit that obstacle, it probably would have killed him. You'd be amazed at what you can do under a one-to-one -one wing loading. Because 999 times out of 1,000, you're probably going to land in the middle of the landing area. Everything's cool. But that one time where you really need to, you know, get that thing on the ground, you're going to wish you maybe had a bigger parachute. 
You know, I think I said in last year's, you know, seminar that I've never ever once heard somebody get carted off in an ambulance saying, man, I really wish I had a small parachute for that landing. I can't say I've heard it. If anybody has heard it, please let me know. So, okay, so let's go on to uh, the aerial photograph. You guys see this all right? <coughs> all right, so. Pond's there, huh? Yeah, we just <laughs> rest in peace, little pond. No, it's not. I um, see it, man. No, it's not. <laughs> it's right there. This. <laughs> This stuff should be relatively straightforward, but today, which way are the winds coming out of? Everywhere. Yeah, and when they come out of the east and they come out of the west, people don't know what to do. Okay, so let's go over the basic patterns. When winds are light and variable, or they're coming off the lake, our default is always landing towards the lake. So what we're looking at, if we have this area right here, the main landing area is 200 jump minimum. Okay, so if we're landing towards the lake and light and variable winds, or winds are coming off the lake, we're going to do a right-hand pattern towards the lake. If winds are out of the south, left-hand pattern towards the buildings. Now, for the student landing area over here, it is going to be the same pattern. Light and variable or winds off the lake, we're going to do a right-hand pattern towards the lake. Winds are out of the south, left-hand pattern towards the buildings. One thing that is very, very important and it drives me nuts is we got the uh, yellow box that is there. Okay, if you're landing out in the uh, less experienced jumper area and we're landing towards the lake, you should not be going south of that yellow box. I can't emphasize this enough because what you are doing is you're cutting in the middle of their landing pattern. And that is probably one of the most dangerous things you can do on this drop zone. Um, and it's really unnecessary. We have a van, it will come pick you up, right? So please, please, please do not go south of that yellow box. Stay in your landing area. They are totally separate landing areas. Okay. Now, if we're going to land over here on the kind of the wingsuit and high performance landing area, um, and actually a bit about the main landing area, 90 degree turns only. But over here we need to be careful because it is high performance. You're going to have people landing downwind, crosswind, carving turns, you know, big 720 degree turns but we're going to mirror image this pattern. So if we are landing ideally into the wind and the winds are coming off the lake, we're going to do a left-hand pattern going towards the lake. So we're staying away from the main runway. And then if winds are coming out of the south, we're going to do right-hand pattern landing that way. We do have the glider runway here, but that landing area is big enough where you can safely do a pattern in between the two. The gliders run on Wednesdays and typically on the weekends. You cannot hear them and they cannot throttle up to go around. So very important if you are going to choose to land over here, keep it in between those runways. Uh, crossing the runways there. What's that? Crossing the runways. Yeah, no crossing the runway under a thousand feet. So let's bring that up. Okay. Now, uh, today winds were out of the east really what the pattern should be for the experienced landing area here should be a right hand pattern to the east any reasons why anybody know why on the base leg away from the obstacles instead of towards the obstacles to put yourself in the forest well yeah what do you mean by that <clears throat> well i said don't put ourselves in the corner yeah well let me explain so if we're going to do this way we're going to do a left-handed pattern and we're going to go this way if you're here and you're going to overshoot, your obstacle, you have obstacles here. All right? But if we go this way with it and we're going to overshoot and hit that fence, we can uh, land slightly crosswind and go that way. Mm -hmm. So you have an out for it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So with the students, what it should be, it should be the same thing here, but it's going to be a left-hand pattern. So if you, you know, that temporary fencing here, if you're going to hit that, you can take it out this way and still be safe. So if winds are out of the west, um, it's going to be left-hand pattern for the main. So if you need to, if you're going to overshoot and hit the runway, you can still take it crosswind that way. And then for the students, it would be uh, something like this, right-hand pattern. So if you need to, you can take it a little bit crosswind and be safe. Okay.
doesn't happen often, but it does happen. So, and I find that when it does happen, people are doing all sorts of different patterns. I saw it from highly experienced people today, uh, mm -hmm. doing some questionable stuff out there. Okay, so next slide. Questions. <laughs> 